Hello everyone, uh, welcome to, to this webinar Using the Sun in More Ways Than One, How Solar Can Contribute to a Sustainable European uh, Agricultural Policy. I am Aurélie Beauvais, the Policy Director of Solar Power Europe, and it is an absolute pleasure to welcome you all today to discuss with us this morning how we can uh, pull synergies between two key sectors of our economy, agriculture uh, and energy, with a particular focus on the solar solutions uh, and how they can contribute to a more sustainable agricultural sector. With a simple focus to start on, uh, on solar energy, I would like to put simply a highlight on some of the latest results of our study on a 100% renewable energy system, uh, which was released um, some two days ago. Uh, so maybe I will directly... Oh, yes, uh, I do have to go through that. So yes, um, if you have a question and answers, uh, you can see here how you can uh, use your control panel to reach out to us. Um, you can send your questions to the presenter uh, using this uh, little box that you see on your control panel. And please do not hesitate to do so. We will treat the questions afterwards during the Q&A. So you see here the agenda. I will do a quick introduction. We will then have presentations from Eva Van Dest, which is the Agri-PB advisor uh, for the French company Amaranco, and also the chairwoman of our uh, soon-to-be-launched this afternoon work stream on Agri-PV. Then we will have uh, Stéphane Schindele, which is agri Voltaics product manager at Beiwa RE, and uh, a short presentation as well from Cristina Lobillo Borero, principal advisor to the director general for agriculture and rural development at the European Commission and also former member of the Cabinet of Commissioner Miguel Arias Cañete for Energy and Climate. Then we will have a quick session of Q&As with our uh, panelists and of course open the floor for all of you so that you can also ask your questions and interact with us on how to boost Agri-PV solutions uh, in the European Union. Okay, so jumping now to the study on 100% renewable energy system, as I was mentioning earlier, you can see here uh, some of the two key graphs of the study that was released recently by Solar Power Europe and LUT University. And maybe one key finding we absolutely need to share, uh, which is not highlighted on this slide, is that obviously 100% renewable energy system is possible. Is possible even before uh, 2050. It can be achieved by 2040. And it uh, really transpires as the most cost efficient way to achieve climate neutrality. It had surprising impacts, uh, lowering the cost of transition for society, notably, and really one of the sharpest um, influence to decline uh, CO2 emissions in the next decade. So I will invite you all to have a look uh, at this study once, uh, once we are through this webinar. Um, it is available on our website and free for, for everyone to download. But maybe one of the two key things which will be important for the discussion today, you see on the one hand that when it comes to solar energy, if we want to achieve climate neutrality and if we want to uh, do it with renewable energies, solar will really play a, a critical role uh, in all three scenarios. Uh, so the laggard one, which is a low ambition scenario, kind of, where we do not reach the Paris Agreement target nor the climate neutrality target, and yet due to the cost competitiveness of solar energy uh, and um, its versatility, um, so very easy solutions to deploy, it already becomes the dominant source uh, in the logout scenario and in the moderate and leadership scenarios where we are actually complying with the climate neutrality requirements without any carbon sinks. Uh, you see solar energy really uh, taking a strong role and with our colleagues from the wind sector becoming uh, the pillars of the energy transition. If you look at the right side, 
you also see that achieving that will require huge uh, volumes of electricity to be able to power both electricity and of course renewable hydrogens uh, which emerge as a second key energy carrier in this study Without diving into more details, I think one of the key insights we will take for the discussion today is how can we actually roll out all these renewables and how can we boost this deployment, notably over the next decade, which is cr a critical decade uh, to ensure we are on the path to climate neutrality by 2050. Moving to the next slide now. Yes. So that brings us to the climate mainstreaming and the European Green Deal. Uh, we were all aware last year discussing climate neutrality that it required huge amount uh, of ambition. And this ambition had to be reflected across all key pillars of uh, the, the European energy policy which is why we were delighted that the president-elect Ursula von der Leyen uh, established the European Green Deal as one of her most critical initiatives um, with the aim of ensuring that we are uh, putting in place the stepping stones to advance on the climate energy transition across all key pillars. Uh, of course, in this, uh, the agricultural sector has really a very uh, strong impact um so the the in the the most uh, ambitious proposal 40% uh of uh, the overall budget uh, which is delivered for uh, for cap should contribute uh to to climate action and i hope christina will be uh, telling us more about that in general uh, the european commission has proposed a farm to fork strategy um, which also aims at supporting the transition to a more sustainable uh, food system, looking at some key features such as the adaptation to climate change, how to contribute to climate change mitigation and encourage uh, positive, positive impacts. Of course, the agricultural sector, as you can guess, is also uh, very strongly impacted by climate change. In some areas, we already see the strong effects of droughts, for example, and it is happening in Europe already, in Southern Europe notably, and in other areas, you will have uh, the reverse effects, for example, in general, unstable weather is not good uh, for crops, um, and it is uh, an interesting point of view to see how AgriPV can contribute to that. Moving to the next slide. Apologies, sometimes the delay is a bit slow. Voila, so just few elements on the, the agricultural sector. Um, of course, when we talk about deploying uh, all these uh, renewable energies, we also talk about how to allocate land in the optimal way uh, when it comes to, to uh, the available surfaces. Today in the European Union, 40% of land uh, is managed by farmers. It is also an area where, of course, there are a lot of jobs. So 44 million people are uh, employed um, in the agri-food uh, sector. Uh, 180 billion euros. Uh, this is the agricultural sector contribution to the European GDP, according to the latest figures. And 38% of MFF uh, funds are today allocated for the preservation and management of natural resources, including uh, for the agricultural sector. Now, this is where, from our perspective, the discussion today is going to be interesting uh, because when we talk about AgriPV solution, we really see a business model where um, the various uh, challenges and opportunities from both the transition of the agri sector and uh, the solar sector can be reconciled. Um, we are truly convinced at Solar Power Europe that AgriPV really creates a business case uh, for the transition of both sectors. And uh, I'm delighted to have our panelists, which will tell us more about the how. Very quickly, uh, we see that the adaptability of the solutions really enable tailor-made approaches to the needs of agricultural and farmer requirements um, when it comes to greening their consumption or simply um, using solar panels to improve uh, the, the, the output of their uh, infrastructures. 
um, we see that there is, of course, uh, increased resource efficiency because this is an area where we reconcile land use uh, to the benefit of both uh, sides. It helps farmers diversify their income and today is a very concrete solution to counteract rural exodus and uh, our panelists will tell you more about that as well. It really creates a triple win, uh, so supporting higher crop yields, lowering water use, uh, which is of course essential uh, the more we go to uh, warmed up temperatures and of course contributes to cleaner electricity generation. So we see it as a very interesting approach which helps tackle climate change and on the other hand support climate change mitigation and adaptation in the agricultural sector in general. It is a very nice solution when we talk about mainstreaming um, climate change across all energy policy pillars. So this is why at Solar Power Europe we have decided to launch this work stream on AgriPV. Uh, and I will not tell you much more about that as we are very lucky to have the chairwoman with us, Eva Vandes from Amaranco. Just to have a look at the various initiatives on which our work stream will focus on, on top of encouraging as well, uh, well, simply raising awareness and helping our own sector to structure itself, uh, putting a light on best practices for the sector, um, and also helping you uh, on the other on the other side uh, of the audience understand more what is agri photovoltaic and what can be done uh, with it. So, without further ado, I am very happy to hand over uh, the floor to our panelists. So, I introduce them uh, in the beginning Eva Vandes from Amaranco, Stefan Schindler from Beiwa RE, and Cristina Lobio Borero from the European Commission. We are really delighted to have you three. And I will now uh, give the floor to Eva Vandes, which is also the chairwoman of our AgriPV Workstream, to tell you more. Thank you. Eva, the floor is yours. Yes, <laughs> thank you Aurélie. Uh, hello everyone. I am uh, very happy to be with you today uh, for this webinar. Uh, I really intend to go on my slides. Yes. Okay. So Amaranko is very proud to assume the chairmanship of the AgriPV work stream that will be launched uh, with Solar Pro Europe in a few hours. Uh, we particularly thank Solar Pro Europe for affording us the opportunity to share and discuss this topic, which is in Amarinko's own DNA. Uh, just to illustrate that, uh, we recently, um, just recently, Credit Agricole, the main bank of uh, agriculture in the world, uh, just became shareholder of, of Amarinko, so our connection with this field uh, is very well uh, settled. The time between two slides, <laughs> maybe I need some help. Yeah. So Amarinko's story started in 2008 uh, with the installation of a solar corporate uh, on a retail parking lot in the small village of Gaillac in south of uh, southwest of France, which is a large agricultural region. Main part of our team is located in La Grave in a lovely countryside uh, castle, still cult cultivating wines. And we are about to launch an experimental project to cover those wines suffering uh, from too hot weather uh, with PV system. Twelve years later, thanks to the ambition and the investment of Amerinko Solar Limited, uh, an investment fund located in Cork Island, the company became a solar IPP and has no seven affiliates worldwide, uh, 130 collaborators, accomplished more than 2,000 projects and has currently 2.5 gigawatts of combined uh, projects and assets. We truly believe that photovoltaic energy and in particular uh, AgriPV is a key in achieving a sustainable life on a beautiful uh, but fragile planet. Indeed, uh, solar can play a major role in supporting energy transition as well as uh, agricultural transition. And those two sectors are major ones for uh, humanity and its future.
Yes, so no, uh, few words about uh, AgriPV. Uh, we envision uh, AgriSolar as a perfect match uh, between an agricultural need and a PV solution that is generating economic returns. AgriPV is mostly described as a combination between agricultural production and PV system. At first, it was considered as a solution to avoid using agricultural land for solar energy production. Then, uh, solar sharing engineering developed and is surely the biggest potential of AgriPV. But we also claim for a holistic approach of AgriPV regarding to our experience in that field. Farmers have many needs we can answer. I will uh, illustrate that point later in my presentation. Thus, we speak about direct and indirect AgriPV depending on the farmer need uh, we are embracing. According to us, AgriPV is rich from its uh, diversity and versatility and should always be a win-win solution for both agriculture and energy sectors. AgriPV, what is it for? In a transitional period, uh, new needs come up, uh, decarbonization of the farms, uh, more autonomy, reinforcing local production, developing an agriculture based on biological control and less chemical one. Agri-PV systems uh, can save water, crops, uh, biodiversity and spices. I will illustrate this later. And finally, Agri-PV allows synergy between two key sectors for humanity, serving and developing rural uh, communities. Yeah, so, next slide. Yes. Our story starts uh, in Corsica with some examples of uh, our experimentation and um, successful uh, project. Amarenko developed uh, 183 projects of farms for uh, 16 megawatts of power plants. Corsican farmers were dependent of further imports from La Plaine de la Croix in south of France and unable to invest in storage. High subsidies were offered uh, by Corsica collectivity to support uh, those importations. Creating a bridge between the two public sectors of agriculture and energy and assuming the coordination of those sectors, Amarenko proposed to invest and to equip farmers with barns for uh, storage, empowering uh, local farms. This has led to a 50% reduction in imports and the subsidies uh, that go with them. This program was a success because farmers ask for more and recently a farmer who works at the agriculture chamber of Corsica told me that for them, AgriSolar just uh, mean barns. That the illustration of how our solar industry can invest in the uh, green transition and be a real uh, actor. Also, um, PV barns contributed to the implementation of the PPE, multi-annual energy programming of the territory of Corsica, oriented towards more energy and agriculture autonomy and increase of uh, renewable energy in the energy mix. The specific tarification in Corsica, feed-in tariff, helps for sure IPPs to be profitable and develop that program despite all the difficulties encountered due to the specific geography of Corsica which is an island with a lot of mountains, uh, high grid connection costs, and land ownership uh, problems. So that illustrates all cooperation uh, between all the sector and private investment and public policy can, can uh, meet and be successful. Yeah, so next slide. Uh, no, just before. Oh, just the one before. Yes, thank you. 
So now let's continue with a new project located in uh, East Corsica. Uh, the project was initiated by a farmer who owns the un unused land of several hectares and was looking to diversify its activity. Amarenko designed with the farmer an arboriculture under shade houses project of 27 hectares, 130 shade houses uh, for 13 megawatts. The project was presented to the National Research Institute of INRA. INRA confirmed the relevance of it uh, after analyzing and modeling. And the partnership provides uh, the study of the impact of sun radiation, luminosity, trees growth and uh, fruits taste. Uh, indeed, uh, one hectare of the plantation will be dedicated to Corsican clementines. Uh, those fruits uh, are losing their special taste because of too much exposition to the sun and face risk of losing their AOP certification. So this is an illustration of all species can benefit also from um, the shade of um, PV panels. Amarenko designed uh, specific checkered shade houses according to the luminosity needs uh, of the trees, thanks to engineering and modelization. The global infrastructure was standard, already known by Amarenko, but the disposal of the panels is innovative considering uh, the specific needs of the trees. So we can see that um, we develop a very um, a lot of expertise um, by experimentation through the experimentation and, uh, and research. Also, the profitability of the specific model study was integrated to ensure that the project would be viable for the farmers and the solar IPP. No, invest, no investment in the infrastructure is asked to the farmer who only takes care of the plantation. After four years of development, uh, finally the power plant will be paid off and be fully profitable after seven or uh, ten years. So you can see it's a long um, uh, research process, uh, cooper uh, cooperation process uh, and investment. Uh, the farmer uh, chose citrus trees because of an existing market uh, with satisfactory uh, outlets in Corsica and uh, he insisted also on the importance of its own, own motivation in learning a new type of culture, investing time, energy and material for uh, decades on it. So now to conclude with the last slide, yes, thank you. To conclude, uh, we can say that those projects uh, regarding our experience in agri-PV sector teach us that the agricultural project and farmers' motivation are key, that those kind of projects can be a huge opportunity to develop solar power plants that can coexist with agricultural land and can even enhance, uh, diversify and protect agricultural production and even species. We learned that the engineering of solar uh, sharing solution can evolve, uh, continue to evolve thanks to innovation. According to the European Green Deal, the EU will be climate neutral in 2050. For that, we need to be ambitious in investments, development and implementation of the successful solution already existing, as well as being innovative and dynamic as an industry. In order to be effective, it is essential that AgriPV runs as a win-win solution for all the stakeholders. The infrastructures, practices and policies need to be developed so that agricultural activities and electricity generation mutually benefit from these emerging technolo technological solutions. That will be the main purpose uh, of our AgriPV workstream. Through this workstream, we place to we aim to place AgriPV high on the European uh, agricultural policy agenda and drive the uptake of AgriPV solutions across Europe by focusing on the reform of the CAP, uh, specifically on its second pillar rural development, 
Crown to Frog Strategy, uh, Climate Change Adaptation uh, Strategy, and Clean Energy for EU Iceland's initiative. Through sharing knowledge and best practices uh, between the agri-PV sector and agricultural experts, the EU can take the lead on agri-PV technologies and the global standard uh, for this solar application. Yes, yeah, so thank you to listen. I will, uh, I think now Stefan from Bewa will uh, take the lead. Yes. yes, thank you a lot, Eva, and welcome, Stefan. So up to you. I think you now have the control panel. I tried to forward the slides. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you very much for the organizers uh, of setting up this meeting today and also a very warm welcome to all the participants um, to this webinar. My name is uh, Stefan. I'm the head of AKPV at Baiva Renewable Energy. I um, work in the field of AKPV since eight years. Before I joined Baiva, I was uh, at the Fraunhofer Institute for Solar Energy Systems. Mm. At the moment, I'm trying to forward the slides, but uh, it seems yes. So, hold on, that was one too much. We at Viva, um, we come originally from the farming sector. Um, now we try to leverage the synergies of the two sectors, the renewable energy and the farming sector, into one product. Um, the uh, mother company uh, waiting for the slides to respond now our mother company has a turnover of about uh, 17 billion euros annually the EBIT is about 188 million we have 19,000 employees and we are a global player having activities in over 40 countries we serve the fundamental needs meaning agriculture energy and construction and i myself work in the biva renewable energy in the energy core segment and we focus on 100 percent renewables now within the company we do now a matchmaking of the two core segments to develop new solutions and uh, in particular we try to look for uh, crop protection solutions um again i need to wait but before i introduce our products i would like to give you an introduction to the market and the potential that we estimate for aquapv the market has grown over the last six years from nothing to over 2000 aquapv systems worldwide it has now reached a capacity of nearly three gigawatt uh, the most projects are implemented in asia namely in Japan, in China and South Korea. However, also in the United States, Massachusetts is a forerider and within the European Union, it's France, where over 40 megawatt of AKPV is installed. We only last week heard that the French government is willing to um, increase its effort uh, and rolling out AKPV for 80 megawatt annually until 2026. So we welcome this initiative. And we have been in contact with, with many other governments, uh, namely in India, Germany, Netherlands, Switzerland, Austria, uh, the Fiji Island and California. Uh, they all have interest in promoting this technology, seeing the huge potential. Then in science, yeah, uh, we can offset. Uh, there is an analysis there. Uh, uh, we can offset the global energy demand if we only use 1% of the cropland with AKPV. And um, if we transfer this to the European cropland area with uh, 173 million hectares, uh, this would translate to over 1,400 gigawatt of PV capacity. But the highest potential, to be honest, we see in the picture on the right bottom, uh, where there is plants, fruits, berries, apple, pears, and so on, grapes already needing crop protection systems like hail nets, hail protection nets, or insect protection security nets. Um, and this is where we see the highest potential. And in Europe, uh, in the 27 uh, member states, we have about 5.7 million hectares uh, uh, of crop area in those special high yield crops. And if we only would translate 20% of this potential, we end up nearly by uh, 900 30 up to a thousand gigawatt peak of potential 
Now, the Fraunhofer Institute for Solar Energy Systems uh, made a potential analysis, uh, the technical potential in Germany. And of all PV segments, the actual PV segment has the largest potential, even more than the rooftop potential. And we only need to untap a few percentage. Uh, we will reach already 81 gigawatt uh, on locations that are very well fitting to a dual use of land. Now, you have to compare those numbers of the potential to what has been installed already. And in Germany, we, for instance, we installed nearly 50 gigawatt. Now we can double this installment only by implementing ACPV. And when you look to the European Union, we have now installed 132 gigawatt, and we can 10 times fold this installed capacity by ACPV. So you see the market is huge. This is why we are there. And of course, we focus on the farmer that he has a benefit from that. This is important. Um, uh, to work with the farmer and also to substitute his uh, original crop protection system. And uh, the technologies we developed and the reference I would like to show you, if my slides move on. Can you maybe enter next? Thank you. So currently uh, we have ready two different types of technologies. One is the single row system, one is the multi-row system yeah, where you can, in the multi-row system, you can actually work with larger and smaller land machinery over the plant. If you don't need to work over the plant, we have the single row systems used for raspberry, for instance. Um, the idea is uh, to dual use of land comes also from a methodology of the food and agriculture organization, the integrated food energy systems, where we really do the food energy water nexus also uh, in order to protect the plants. So we talk about main agricultural protection and secondary solar power produce uh, yield production. The, uh, we actually apply and adapt the PV generator to the benefits of the plant so it grows better. And um, the reference you can see in the next slide. Um, here, there was the research facility um, with, uh, we worked together with Fraunhofer Institute. We actually did this on crop and grain land. We made research on potato, wheat, clover, and celery. And uh, especially in the year 2018, which was a very hot, and dry year, we had more agricultural yield under the ACPV system compared to the reference without ACPV. We have uh, all the evidence there about the economics. We have the evidence about the CO2 balance of that systems. And however, we have to say that this type of technology with the harvester operating below that system is pretty expensive uh, uh, in relation to, let's say, crane. Um, so therefore, we don't think that this is a best practice. However, it was very good to gain the first information on how we can design what type of agricultural machinery we can operate below this type of uh, technology. We use bifacial models, uh, meaning that the, we use the albedo effect, so the light that is reflected on the surface, the land surface going on the back shield of the PV model, and we gained 8% of increase in power yield because of that. Um, making up for the lower electricity yields that we see because of more light going through for the plant growing. On the next slide, uh, you see a project that um, what we are, as a company, are very proud for. We established this at the moment in the Netherlands. This is the pilot project from last year. And this is really where we think the future of AKPV is. When we can substitute existing cro cropping systems uh, here it is a foil tunnel that is substituted with PV and um, we did a test with conventional PV models, with standard active PV special models and with foil tunnel and we received the best results with our special active PV models. Therefore, the farmer has decided to increase the size of that pilot and operate active PV on the entire land area that he is dedicating for raspberry growing. We found out that the farmer then has less investment, he has less waste, less labor in the operation because uh, the uh, ACPV system lasts for 30 years, while the foil tunnel is only there for five to seven years. So we really can minimize the cost for the farmer and give him a, a benefit from uh, the ACPV system and at the same time, of course, produce solar electricity. Now, 
Here on the next slide, you see a, a picture from last week, the week after Easter. Uh, this is how it looks like at the moment. The construction is already there. The PV models will be delivered in the next weeks. So in the end of May, we will have finished this construction site. It has about three hectares, about 2.7 megawatt. Yeah? And I welcome everybody who wants to visit that site to drop me an email and we can arrange that. Yeah? Uh, we use the special PV models in order to increase also the share of agricultural yield. However, yeah, now this is a really cool technology and uh, we know globally that it works and we also know that there's a benefit to the farmer, but there's also challenges uh, to that technology. And on the next slide, you can you please forward, thank you. I want to name out and call those channels. It's what needs to be done. Well, uh, for instance, we don't have a techno technological PV standard yet. Uh, there is within the PV industry and the farming sector discussions ongoing of what is actually PV, what technology counts for it and which maybe doesn't. Um, we also know that it is complex and it is a slow process when two sectors like highly coordinated sectors like the agricultural and the energy sector needs to actually work together and adapt their policies and have political learning and all the policy making for that. Um, we also know of the disadvantage that we are not cost competitive. Of course, uh, we cannot compete with ground mounted PV that is, uh, has lower steel and uh, is not elevated and does not give the synergies. With Aqua PV, we have the benefits for the farmer and we obtain the land. However, we are more expensive. And uh, at the moment, there's a lot of policies out there regulating ground mounted PV and rooftop PV, but Aqua PV is simply not existing, the regulations. So we beg. Uh, the policymakers to include the AQPV as a, a serious segment in their regulation. And we need those demand pull support regulations in order to attract investment, uh, in order to have the private sector developing and being innovative and to reach a level where we can really say we have economies of scale and bring down those costs. Uh, uh, therefore, the potential will even increase. So what needs to be done? Well. We need to have a level playing field for AQPV. Uh, we need to include these into our regulations, whether this is tenders programs or whether this is feed-in tariffs. Um, AQPV needs to be included in that. And uh, on the European level, uh, we ne really need to harmonize the common agricultural policy standards for AQPV. I want to give you one example. If a fruit producer or berry producer in Germany operates land under AQPV, he does not receive any cap subsidy anymore. The same farmer, if he would be in France, he would receive it. So we really ask the Commission to harmonize those processes in order to have a level playing field amongst the farming sector and also access to those CAP. Um, we need to address that in, in particular in renewable energy implementation, there, there will be land use change. Uh, of, the uh, fuel or fork strategy uh, belongs to that and that there is land take considered. And AQPV contributes to a net zero land take strategy from the European Union. So we can promote AQPV also in this aspect. And of course, it is global warming. So we need adaptation strategies and a unique selling point of AQPV is that it does not just contribute to mitigation, it also contributes to adaptation. And this we have to promote and accept that by implementing the adaptation strategy, AQPV can be included uh, and therefore create jobs, especially in rural areas. We can learn from governments that have already established uh, AQPV implementation policies. We can look to Massachusetts, where I personally think that is a good way they found there, or we can look to France, where it's more the innovation term of AQPV that is promoted. Um, important is that we promote it. And uh, yeah, we can produce healthy food and clean energy from one area. Let's rethink the energy and also let's rethink the agriculture. I uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to your question. Thanks a lot, Stefan. So thanks to you too. I think uh, those two presentations were great and really introducing uh, the topic perfectly for Cristina Lovillo Borero. So that uh, Cristina, uh, you can give give us the perspective from the European Commission as well as from your background uh, in energy and agricultural policy. Uh, Cristina, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. Yes, no, that's good. There was a little echo. So, uh, so uh, thank you, Orly, Eva, and Stefan for for your presentation. Um, I have I have learned no, a lot. So uh, because it's really good to have practical examples on how energy and um, and agriculture, in particular, and the renewable sector, um, really there are important synergies. So I, I would like, to, as a representative of the Commission in particular from DG Agriculture, and also based on my previous experience, my recent previous experience as head of cabinet to commissioner dealing with climate change and agriculture, I would like to give my, um, to give you my, my views on the, where is the background we have now uh, in the new, uh, in the new commission in President von der Leyen Commission? Um, also, uh, the new situation in the light of the uh, COVID-19 crisis. I think we, we need to, uh, to say also a few words on how this crisis could affect also the, the commission working program. And, um, and finally, uh, of course, I want to focus on the agriculture sector. I am working now in DG Agri, and um, I, I am a principal advisor to the director general, and I, I work in particular on the different uh, links uh, between the initiative stemming from the Green Deal and the Common Agriculture Policy. So um, I would like to, to start by uh, traveling back a little bit. I, I would like to travel with you to Paris in December uh, 2015, when the, the Paris Agreement um, changed, uh, let's say, the, the international mindset on, on climate change. You know that it was the first time that uh, more than 190 countries agreed on international commitment about reducing the temperature of the, of the planet. And um, I, I had the opportunity to, to participate in those negotiations. And I can say that something that really changed uh, in, in Paris. And uh, it's, never, it's never easy to have an international commitment on, the, um, on a specific topic. But I think that the Paris Agreement is a clear example, and um, also uh, different that this, uh, the subsequent COPs uh, has built up on the, on the commitment of the Paris Agreement, and the now will continue uh, the COP on the different implementing topics I mean from the, from the Paris Agreement. What was the role of the European Union in the Paris Agreement and onward? Well, you, you all know that the European Union is by far uh, the group of countries uh, that have um, more ambitious targets when it comes to greenhouse gas emission reduction, also on energy efficiency and on renewables, uh, both production and consumption. And um, not only the, the fact that we have the, the highest and most ambitious targets, but also I think that our credibility is based on the fact that we have the legislation in force. Hmm? During the last uh, four years, um, the Commission and together with the co-legislator, the Council and the, and the European Parliament, we put in, the, um, in, the, in force a very comprehensive legal framework on climate change measures and also on the energy uh, sector. So I, I want to mention in particular the clean energy package for all Europeans, also the, the emission trading scheme, the F4 sharing, and, uh, and of course the climate neutrality strategy. So the, the von der Leyen Commission um, has um, endorsed this climate change policy, uh, but has even go uh, one step ahead uh, because um, the Green Deal is uh, includes, in, the, in my view, two main overarching objectives that is very important to, to bear in mind. The first one, there is a commitment to uh, increase the greenhouse gas emission reduction by uh, 50 or even 55, uh, and uh, the president added in a reasonable way. I mean, uh, considering that we also uh, take on board the social and the economic um, elements. Um, and secondly, uh, the Green Deal also endorses the climate neutrality. Mm -hmm. So uh, both commitments are, are very ambitious. We cannot hide that they're very ambitious and uh, very costly. 
and very inclusive, I'd say, because we cannot talk about uh, reaching 50 or 55 percent of greenhouse gases emission reduction or even climate neutrality if we do not consider all the economy sectors. So um, I, I want to, to remind with you the scenarios that we had in the, in the climate neutrality strategy. Uh, if you remember, we have uh, eight scenarios. Five of them aims at reducing the greenhouse gas emission by 80%, one uh, 90%, and uh, two of them aims at uh, reducing greenhouse emission uh, toward the climate neutrality. We cannot say 100%, we say climate neutrality because uh, the agriculture sector needs to offset the, the, the emission. So um, this is very important because there is a common line in the eight scenarios is that um, around 80% of the energy produced in the European Union uh, will be uh, electricity and will come from renewables. So this means that the renewable sector will have to, to deploy different technologies and, um, and uh, even the classical ways of producing um, a renewable energy, uh, solar or wind, will need also to, to cover other sectors, um, such as agriculture. And I will move now to, to agriculture because it's the topic of, uh, of course, of this, of this uh, webinar. Um, allow me to, to remind you that when we talk um, about agriculture, uh, we talk about land use options. You know that we have mainly three options uh, related to land use. First is agriculture land, I mean the, the use of land for, for the production of food. Second, forest. And third, the natural habitat. And uh, you can imagine that there is a competition on the, on the use of agricultural lands. Uh, first, we had the production of, um, of food and feed for animal uh, purposes, of course, the, the so-called food security, which is um, fundamental in particular in this, um, in this precise moment of the COVID-19, where the production of food uh, has become the first priority in the, in the world. Uh, the second, um, the second point is the development of um, of forest, and uh, and third, the supply of bioenergy and other renewable energy in the agriculture sector. Um, we have on the table um, a CAP, a common agriculture policy, uh, ongoing uh, reform, and uh, this um, this reform um, aims at enhancing the climate change and environmental. Um, commitment for farmers, uh, but at the same time, uh, aims of course to ensure the food security because it's the is the main uh, purpose of the um, of the common agriculture policy. Uh, now with the green deal, uh, we'll have new proposals on the on the table, uh, like the Farm to Fork, the biodiversity strategy, the European climate law that has been already adopted by by the College of Commissioner and that will entail also a review of the, um, the land use, the so-called LULUCF, the land use change and, and forestry. And, um, and we'll also um, uh, imply some uh, new commitment for, for farmers. So um, this is where we are now. We are in, the, um, in a moment where we need to explore all the, the potential of the um, agriculture sector. Um, when it comes to the production of renewables, uh, everybody who thinks in the in the agriculture sector immediately thinks on the um, on the bioenergy because it seems that it's uh, very much linked to to the to the production of this kind of, of energy. But um, you also may know that in the agriculture sector we have many small and medium scale installations that provide opportunities for new cooperation. Uh, not only in production, but also in sales and uh, distribution of uh, renewable energy. Uh, you, you also may know that there are many technologies that can be combined by farmers, and um, these technologies are available to, to meet energy use on the farm, um, heating, cooling, traction, and other energy functions. Uh, you you know that the the commission um, has uh, has to follow a very uh, let's say holy principle in the in the energy sector and in particular in renewables that we 
fully respect the principle of uh, technological neutrality. I mean, the Commission never, um, uh, let's say, put the assent on the specific um, uh, technology. Um, all the European sector can use the technologies they consider the best, but of course, the Commission uh, really uh, boost the, the, develop the deployment of renewable energies in all sector. And uh, we've seen that agriculture is, um, is a sector with a strong potential to develop um, solar, wind, and new technologies that are still uh, developing and that they will need to contribute to the, to the objective of uh, 2030 and also the climate neutrality. Allow me to also to give you some, uh, before finishing my presentation, some words on the current situation. Um, you follow the actuality of the European Union, in particular the, the European Commission. Uh, we are now in an unprecedented uh, crisis, the coronavirus and all the uh, consequences, in particular for, for the health of European citizens and uh, all the citizens in the, in the world. And uh, the European Union has taken um, important measures to try to cope with this crisis. Health is first, uh, but second, of course, we need to ensure, as, as I mentioned before, the, the food security. I mean, the, the agriculture sector has proved its resilience in the middle of this crisis. Um, but there is one element that is very important uh, for me because I, in particular, because I am a firm believer in climate change and uh, and uh, the effect, the, the good effect for for the planet and for all citizens in the world. And uh, so I really want to welcome the words by President von der Leyen and by the Executive Vice President Timmermans that they have confirmed that we need to to overcome this crisis. Um, bearing in mind the no, no backlighting principle, let's see that we cannot give up on our uh, climate change and environmental objectives. Uh, so um, we fully believe in our recovery that will have to be done with more renewables, more energy efficiency, more sustainable agriculture. Um, this does not mean that we'll need to, to have some adaptation of our commission uh, working program. And with our um, multi-annual financial framework, you know that the president of the commission has announced that on the 29th of April, she will come up with um, a review version of the commission working program for 2020, and also the multi-annual financial framework. Um, but uh, what really is very reassuring is that, of course, the, the Green Deal as cross-based priority uh, stay very high in the, in the agenda. And, and I think that as European Union, we have to, to lead by, by the example. And, um, and I'm very happy to, to have the opportunity to convey this message to, to you now in this seminar. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to listening to your questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Christina. Uh, I think you, you gave us a, a lot of food for thought as well, uh, covering uh, really uh, uh, various uh, aspects. So indeed, the, the contribution of the Green Deal in general, I think very useful, pointing out some elements um, for the, the conversation. So related to, to land use, the revision of the, the Lulu CF, indeed, I think would be uh, an interesting piece. I think it's interesting as well to discuss technology neutrality and at the same time uh, the need to encourage uh, some solutions that have proven their efficiency uh, or could really contribute to this uh, climate mainstreaming. So yes, nice, dis nice discussion ahead and we have plenty, plenty of questions from the audience. So I will try to sum up and make some little cluster uh, for you guys. Maybe simply, you know, I will simply follow up with you with a, a little question do you see, I mean, at the European Commission level, do you see already the impact of climate change on the sector of agriculture? Um, yes, I mean, indeed. Uh, there is, uh, in particular, the, the ongoing CAP reform that we have on the table now, I just presented, well, adopted by the College of Commissioners in June uh, 2018, um, is, um, is a try to, 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 to adapt the agriculture policy to climate change uh, commitment. 
I want to give you maybe one uh, important information that I'm sure that you you all may know is that uh, you know that the, uh, the emission of the, the greenhouse gas emission in the agriculture sector uh, were for the first time measured in the Kyoto Protocol, but it was the Paris Agreement, the first international agreement that um, include agriculture as a sector that is also obliged to reduce greenhouse gas emission. So um, this is it's a fundamental commitment for, for the world community, but of course also for the European Union. And um, the current reform that we have on the table now, uh, it is still under negotiation. We are waiting for the starting of the, um, of the, uh, uh, the trailer with the Parliament and the, and the Council. But um, this reform is a clear response to uh, our climate change commitment, in particular in the agriculture sector. Thank you. I think it's interesting as well to to see, let's say, the various contribution of the, the, the agri PV business model in the sense that I think agri agriculture is responsible for maybe 10%, let's say, of uh, EU emission, uh, something like in in this range. And indeed, I think when we look at the CO2 emissions from the agricultural sector, we're, we're not necessarily talking about electricity consumption. It's mostly uh, emissions related to methane and the use of uh, other um, other energies. So when we talk about Agri-PV, I think the discussion really is on the impact for mitigation uh, or, or as we see the, the contribution here to, to really create opportunities for, um, for farmers as well. And there are a lot of questions in this sense uh, from the audience notably. So really on, um, let's say, what are the needs from the, the farming sector, maybe for you, Eva and Stefan, because you, you said you are meeting uh, the, the, the needs. There is really a, an encounter a synergy here. So from your perspective, what is the, what are the most important contribution to be considered here? Yes, um, yeah. okay, I will start. Uh, I think the main, uh, the main contribution we can bring with this PV panels now on uh, agricultural, uh, it's uh, protection of the crops. Uh, protection on uh, we we now have um, enough experimentation and uh, good results uh, on how agri PV can um, can protect uh, some fruits uh, some uh, vegetables uh, or trees about insect attack as uh, Stephen mentioned with a uh, net uh, with a uh, very smart technology um and uh, and complementary um and uh, also from the too much uh, radiation sun we know that in south of europe uh, wines very suffer last summer about that and uh, they need shadow uh, also um what we don't uh, think that much it's um for medicinal uh, plant or some type of culture uh, mm -hmm. like vanilla in La Réunion, we are working on that. We really need a uh, dark uh, condition uh, and, um, uh, and be protected by the, the, the sun or even uh, be uh, some culture that uh, should stay secret. Uh, so this is uh, full protection we can uh, bring uh, with our panels. Um, yes, yeah, so I think the protection is the main and also with the climatic alea, uh, with the greenhouses, we are able to, to protect uh, and specifically in Iceland um, from some strong um, climate um, event, um, too much water or too much wind or and to control inside the greenhouses uh, the, uh, the, the, the condition. Uh, but what I wanted also to underline in my presentation was that we, we just discovered uh, working with the farmer because the two sectors are just uh, learning uh, one each other and uh, with this uh, very successful um, uh, story in Corsica with uh, the, the need of storage uh, because uh, farmers uh, uh, the transition is for them too high level of investment in infrastructure and they can afford them uh, some infrastructure. So with our private investment, uh, we can uh, help, her, uh, help them sorry, and uh, work with the farmers and bring a, a solution for all the farm. 
that's what we talk about an holistic approach and also just to finish with that i think in the future yes it's too long okay <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sorry eva because we'll have plenty of no, questions no, okay. right. As Stephanie, you would like to, to complement yes uh, maybe on one thing yeah, and i think this is very crucial yeah? when you look at the farmer yeah, uh, at the moment already in spring 2020 we have a trot there's not much rain. I'm not sure how it is in other nations of the, the uh, European Union, but here in Germany, at least, this is the case. Yeah. So the farmer is suffering from a drought. He has not enough water. If you provide shade, uh, uh, we decrease the evaporation rate in the soil. So uh, we have more water in the soil. And at the same time, when the temperature is increasing, this also subtracts water from the plants, meaning water transpiration. So we also can reduce this effect and water will become very crucial in the future. We believe the plants are getting sunburned and at the same time, the farmer is suffering from a lot of regulation because of pesticides and the farmer is suffering from increasing labor costs in his harvest. So we see that the costs for the farmer and the risk for the farmer increases while the, the, the global market uh, the, today, you know, raspberries or blueberries, you can get, give pro, you can get them in the supermarket all year long. They come from India, they come from Chile, it's a global market. So we see that the costs for agricultural products, they are stable. So increasing cost, stable revenues means less profit. So the farmers are making less profit and this is why they're protesting and this is why they're upset uh, and this is why they call for the policymakers to say, hey, well, you gotta help us. Uh, and then you need to look for solutions. How can you really help the farmer? And this is where AgriPV comes in. We can give them free of charge protection systems. They don't have to take this investment. This comes from the PV sector. This is really where we see the synergies. But the policymakers, uh, they are too slow. They're only looking in, well, I'm do doing energy. The others are looking, I'm doing agriculture. They should talk to each other. And this is what we are looking for. Thank you, Stefan. Looking at the, the approach on cost, I think, because that, that was a question that was asked a lot by uh, our audience uh, to you too, Eva and Stefan. I mean, yes, but on the on the developer side, basically, as in the end, we have constraints uh, relating to the scale, relating to the, 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 the shape of the agricultural installation itself. How does the business model work uh, on your side then? Eva, you want to start or should I? Um, as you prefer. <laughs> then I, I, I start and you go next. No. Yes. The, the, the business model, at least for permanent cultures and high yield crops, yeah, uh, we see that the, the investment uh, into foil production or greenhouse tunnels, uh, they have to be made every five to seven years. Our systems last 30 years. So we, the upfront investment of the farmer, we can take over. And in the operation every seven years, let's say, yeah, we have four times this up, up, uh, operation. And beginning of this year, we had heavy storms in, in Germany. And those foil systems, they're very often they're damaged by, by storms, by heavy wind or by hail in the, in the, in the uh, autumn season. And then the farmer has the operation cost and class uh, is, is more protective. You see, you cannot, this hail doesn't destroy photovoltaics and the wind, the, st the structure with steel uh, is really more sustainable. Also in, in terms of CO2 emissions, that is a critique often raised. Yeah? So we can really provide a protection systems financed by the energy sector and giving a synergy to the farmer. And therefore we get this land area free of charge. The farmers are willing to provide access to area in other ground mounted systems. We have to pay a land rent, sometimes quite high. We don't have to give that if we provide synergies. So it's a mutual benefit on the business case on that. However, sometimes there is more extra work for the farmer and uh, because he has all those protection systems. Yeah? And then this is where we see a chance uh, uh, for also the cap policy to step in and say, well, if we have on average yeah, sometimes a benefit, sometimes a lower benefit because of shading, then we can implement AQPV into the adaptation strategy of the European policy making and ask for a risk premium. So we support directly the farms operating underneath AQPV. This would give an incentive for farmers to say, yes, I, I want this technology. And this is, I think, where I would ask Christina 
how she sees the chances uh, that really ACRE-PV can be part of the adaptation strategy. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. yeah, just to add a few words, but I think uh, everything and, and was said. Everyone, you to, so, sorry Eva, just before you start, for everyone that's valid, uh, so we have a lot of questions, maybe 15 minutes conversation, so let's try to, to stay sharp. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Just to add a few words, but I am nothing uh, that much to, to, to add. Uh, just say that, uh, be aware that it's a long investment. Uh, it's years to develop. Uh, uh, once we have find some standards, experiment successful experimentation, we can uh, multiply it and implement it. But uh, keeping uh, in the mind that um, it will also depend on the geographic condition. So uh, one solution which is successful here won't be in another place. So you have to adapt and uh, be innovative and uh, expert uh, each time. And it's so. And to uh, to us, our business model is uh, only relying on the uh, solar industry. Uh, so we are uh, the one who invest. We don't ask for the farmer to participate on the photovoltaic uh, solution. They have uh, to invest in their plantation if it's a new one. And uh, uh, yes, and, and the better is when uh, both uh, start at the same time, plantation and uh, photovoltaic uh, solution. So. It's, it's, it can be a huge, a huge investment uh, at the beginning uh, for both and years. Uh, and just to finish with that, that there is always a risk and uh, alia uh, that has to, 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 to be taken in account also. Thank, thank you, Eva. I think it's good that you mentioned innovation because I think uh, industrial leadership and, and boosting uh, European innovations uh, is also a very strong objective of the European Commission. So I think AgriPV really also ticks uh, that box when we look at the, the pioneering role that European uh, companies take uh, in this regard. Christina, you had quite some questions uh, in, in between the lines as well from the panelists. So indeed, I mean, I think from your background, uh, from DGNR and Agri, you are very right to say that in the end, technology neutrality has always been a very strong uh, pillar of the European Commission work. Um, we, we might not always agree, but we do understand, um, even though for some uh, innovative uh, elements like that, maybe there is a way to, to think um, European policies differently. So maybe encouraging, for example, smart use of land uh, through a dedicated uh, dedicated tools, encouraging business models that actually help pooling synergies or contribute to the mainstreaming element. So that's an open question to you. How, if you were to, to I mean, how would you basically uh, see potentially a, a European framework that could help boosting these business models? And then we would not simply think of AgriPV, but any business model that actually encourages um, the mainstreaming aspect, contributing to higher revenues for agriculture, contributing to facing uh, adaptation and mitigation in the agricultural sector, and indeed at the same time, contributing to achieving our renewable targets. So it's a bit brainstorming, but uh, what do you have? Uh, how, how would you see that, Christina? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. This is a very, uh, very interesting uh, area of discussion. I want to start my, uh, my comments by um, Replying to to Stefan on the, um, on one important point, I cannot agree more that uh, we need to work more than ever, um, not in a it's isolated way, but we need to all the policies now are more related than ever. We cannot think on agriculture today uh, without uh, thinking on the potential for energy for environment. So. I think that this is really the time to, to think in cross-based policies more, more than ever. And I think that the Green Deal is a clear example of that. Because all the sectors, as I mentioned in my, in my presentation, are, are linked. Uh, this is the first point I wanted to, to make very general, but then just uh, going to the, to the, to the ground. Um, I think that now the common agriculture policy, the, the reform that is, uh, is now ongoing, uh, there is a fundamental element that I want to, to highlight here today with you, 
is that the new the new reform introduces one element is the so-called national plan um, the common agricultural policy will not be centralized anymore i mean now member states will have to uh, to prepare their own national plan and in this national plan they need to um, include uh, the different uh, requirements that they have for the direct payment and also for rural development and for, in for investment. And I think this is a new opportunity for member states to uh, adapt the farming sector, not only to the food production, but as I mentioned before, to the potential the agricultural sector has in particular on the, on the renewable sector. Um, I want to give you a very, a very specific example. Um, of course, now the, we have to respect the treaty and the, the Comarica the policy has to, to, um, to respect and to honor very clear uh, principle in trying in the, in the treaty. So Comarica policy, the first part was, of course, the, the production of food. But now I think that we need to combine this priority on the on the potential that uh, the land use has for farmers i uh, it also depends on the different uh, weather conditions in member states so this is the reason why the rural development now will be more adapted to the needs of each member state i see that the technology you have presented should have more uh, acceptance in some member states than, than another so this is the reason why the member state will have the opportunity now to, to boost some uh, technologies and to send them to the commission. The commission will assess all these technologies and will give the agreement to finance uh, measures on the rural development uh, pillar. So I think this is a very interesting, um, let's say, area of thinking for, for the future. I strongly recommend you to um, just to talk to, to member states in particular with the, um, the Ministry for Agriculture and Rural Development that are now uh, preparing the SWOT analysis of this common agriculture program. And, uh, and another important um, way to, to reflect on, um, I will mention the Invest uh, European Union. You know that 30% um, of this fund will have to be devoted to green technologies. And I, I believe that agriculture is an area on which this uh, funding could be, um, could be uh, dedicated. I really, I think it's a good um, way to, to, I mean, to reflect a good piece to, to think where um, in the future uh, these new technologies can be rewarded. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Any reaction uh, from uh, Eva or Stefan to that? Speaking yeah, directly think, to, to... Yes, go ahead. Yes, uh, I think uh, there was one point uh, from Christina which is very important, uh, that the argument that AKPV is the main agricultural production and secondary PV that relates to the agricultural ministries. So the demand for RKPV really has to come from the farming sector and it has to come from the agricultural ministries. They have to understand that renewable energy will consume a lot of land and we need to look for solutions and RKPV can be one solution. Of course, there's many, but RKPV can, can be one. So when those national plans are developed, uh, then I totally agree with Christina, it has to come from the agricultural ministries. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stefan. Maybe a, a question to you, Eva, because I, I think we've been, uh, so it's true, I think when we think of Agri TV, the, the, the direct element we go to is, is land use, because indeed the, the, in relation with the crops, etc. I have a question from the audience on how we envisage the contribution uh, to Agri PV to what we would call, let's say, smart industry. Uh, also looking at the modernization of the infrastructures, like the buildings themselves, so contributing to, for example, uh, cleaner heating and cooling or um, encouraging a more direct synergy uh, with, uh, for example, the, the infrastructures on the building aspect, uh, thinking of a, a barn, for example, or this kind of things. Um, Eva, I think Amaranco has been uh, contributing to similar uh, installations. No, would you like to say a bit about that? Um, Yes, I think maybe we can um, link that to the innovation uh, and adaptation we can develop with um, our engineering. Uh, I, I, I 
I can uh, more agree uh, on the fact that the farmer and the need of the farm is uh, very important and uh, our engineer and in infrastructure and also uh, on the composition of the PV panel uh, can really be smart and adapt. Uh, now we, we saw uh, very recently those vertical also uh, infrastructure. We have a rooftop, a rooftop and different kind of uh, building uh, we invent. And with these shade houses also, we can pilot them and play with the sun radiation. We learn more and more now about the composition of uh, this sun radiation now and a kind of um, um, uh, luminosity and uh, waves uh, from the sun we want to keep or not. Uh, so on the panel, we can really play with the shadow, um, with the distance um, between the cells uh, of the panels. And yes, so there is ingenuity. Uh, we can uh, really develop in the infrastructure. Um, yeah. Um, maybe, Eva? yeah, when you talk about smart industry, uh, I think of digitalization and autonomization. And um, we work together with the land machinery producer FENT from HECO and uh, for electric mobility in the land sector. So AKPV is producing electricity and on the farm side, but where does it go? And the, mm -hmm. our thought is that uh, yes, the, the farmer also needs electric tractors and electric land machinery. So it's on the demand side where we bring production and demand together on the farm and further in the cooling houses that are all electrified. So when you think of an apple producer, uh, uh, he's having his harvest in, let's say, September, October in Europe. And then uh, he wants to supply apple throughout the year, but he has to have a cool house for that. So it consumes a lot of electricity. So by looking for energy solutions, including a storage facility, like an electric storage, and by electrifying the farm, yeah, he also has the electricity for the digitalization. And this is where we think that because of blockchain programming, the farmer cannot just sell his fruits and berries very efficiently, but also the electricity that he supplies in future. Because most farms in Germany, at least, they already have PV on their rooftops. And now they can access via Acre PV their land capacity and therefore become a food and an energy supplier via blockchain. And mm. for that is the digitalization process that we are working on. Yeah, I think uh, for the future, we have plenty of ideas. The question also will be to follow with a good business uh, model and underline the need to to, to economic returns for the farmer and uh, and the IPP and uh, it's sure that self-consumption and the more local production, more autonomy of the farm linked uh, with the, all the community around the farmer who can find uh, his role on supplying a, a renewable for for his neighbors. It's it's really a vi vision we have, but now we have to find also the good business model to to make it uh, viable and uh, and sustainable. Digitalization also, uh, a lot of investment has been done, but the profitability of this model and also because we are also uh, focusing on small and medium sized farms uh, and it's not the same um, it's not the same IPV when we talk about big farms uh, with uh, maybe more capacity of investment and small farmers, but mm -hmm. solar has this capacity uh, to be profitable even in a small with small installations. There is no difference uh, between uh, on cost between a, a small and a big one. So we can mm -hmm. really work also with small farmers and uh, a local production. Yeah. Very, very, very innovative indeed. So I hope uh, in our work, we'll be able to flesh out uh, all these very interesting uh, business models. Maybe one question also, which popped in a lot, and I think uh, would be relevant as well for Christina. I mean, how do you see um, the link with communities when it comes to AgriPV? In the end, do you see a pushback 
uh, do you see that this kind of business models are easing uh, public acceptance uh, when it comes to, for example, larger scale solar installations or solar installations in uh, different areas? And yeah, how? What is the difference engaging with the community for such kind of projects uh, compared to traditional solar projects? You want me to start? Or? Uh, Christina, I mean, I, I was asking to Eva and Stefan actually from their experience on the ground, but I think if you have uh, some okay. inputs on. And okay, no, no, maybe after yeah? Stefan and Eva, because I want to mention something, but after Stefan and, uh, and Eva. Okay. Yes, of course. Okay. Stefan, Eva, maybe a quick yeah. uh, reaction, and then Christina, uh, we're, yeah. we're happy to listen to you. Yeah. A quick reaction. We did this uh, scientific accommodation in our research facility where we included the local citizens into our science research design and we asked them what are their thoughts and also fears of that technology before we installed the, the, the AQPV plant. And we did the same afterwards. So we could compare what was it before, what was it after. And we found out that uh, from all renewable energy uh, and we did with wind onshore, with biogas, uh, aquafuels, and conventional ground mounted uh, that the acceptance for AKP was the highest, simply for the reason that food production was maintained. Yeah, yeah I can just um, yeah uh, underline the, that it's true that a lot of farmers are really enthusiastic. Uh, it's it's quite surprising, in fact. Uh, they are really interesting, curious, and engaging uh, in this kind of project. But maybe uh, at the condition also that they are included at the project at the beginning, um, because it's it's harder when you come with a PV infrastructure and then you try to find the farmers, which because uh, also it's different kind of culture and it's sometimes another work uh, to work under this uh, greenhouse and with the shadows and the farmers have not the, all the tools. So, but when the community and, uh, and the farmers are uh, from the beginning, uh, there is a lot of enthusiasm and the farmer are really, uh, they have plenty of ID in fact. <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. Okay. Stefan, I will have to give yeah. the floor to, to Christina. Okay. Um, because Christina, you wanted to react on what you heard. So I think we still have a bit more time for discussion. So feel free to, to cook our panelists uh, a bit and, uh, and share with us your reactions. No, be very, very brief on my side, but I want to insist on one, on one point that I think is, is important. Um, uh, maybe the, the rural sector is, um, is the one who maybe will take uh, longer before adapting to, to producing the renewable energies. And why? I mean, I think because traditionally, and uh, not traditionally, but even uh, today, as I said before, uh, the agriculture sector is um, obliged by, by the treaty and the um, principal and first activities, the production of food in a sustainable way. But, um, I mean, I, I have gone back to the agriculture um, sector, I mean, to the agri since uh, December, and I am very uh, positively surprised to see that um, in, the, in the European Union, uh, there is a, a high awareness in the rural uh, community uh, on the on the possibilities that uh, not only the production of uh, renewables but also and you, uh, you have mentioned before how uh, they need to modernize their farming their exploitation how they need also to 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 have electric um, um, uh, mobility how they need to consume also renewables in the in their own farming which is also I mean it's the two phases of the coin that I think is important to mention not only that they can be actor in the in the new technology for the production of renewable energy, but also that they need to consume energy, uh, renewable energies. And this is very important. And I think that both the Commission and Member States, we have a huge responsibility on, the, um, on communicating to the farming sector uh, the new potential that the renewable energy uh, will entail for, for them. This is a comment that I wanted to, um, to make. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Some reactions from the panel? No. no? I, had one, I had one more point to the public acceptance. Yeah. 
Yeah. And uh, now the, the critique of the citizens is very often that the landscape is becoming destroyed, right? Like if you look at wind energy or large scale ground mounted and so on. And of course, AKPV is also faced with that critique here. Yeah? And this is why we think uh, when you substitute yeah, existing greenhouses and hail protection systems and foil tunnels and so on, this is where the landscape is already affected. So by adding PV on top of that, yeah, we have a very neutral landscape. The landscape doesn't change so much, but we have the positive aspect of producing solar electricity. Yes. Yes, and uh, the public has acceptance and also uh, a better knowledge uh, of the collectivities and the authorities. Uh, we really understand and uh, hear that their concerns about um, what is happening uh, on this uh, agri-PV because some experimentation were very successful, but uh, some were not. So we, and this works, so imagine the main uh, goal is really to play the game and um, and to have uh, the best overview we can have with AgriPV uh, and, and also talk with uh, these collectivities that are giving authorization and uh, support and control all, all the long of the development of the project. So it's important that they are included uh, also in the reflection. Yes, you're right, Eva. Um, Christina, maybe, I will jump to you for one last question before we enter the closing remarks. Um, I would like to say to all the audience, because there was a lot of questions on the specificity of the project developed by Amaranco and Beiwa. And so we will propose simply to interact with Stefan and Eva after the webinar and make sure that you have all your answers uh, satisfied. So which type of PV panel, what are the exact crop yields? Uh, how much is the weight of the citrus? And all these kind of uh, interesting questions yet that we could not address for, for this session. So we will come back to you with answers and you will also have the slide because there was some request to be able to contact some of you uh, afterwards. Um, Christina, simply as you mentioned, the Lulu CF, and there are also a lot of questions. So I will take maybe the main cluster. Uh, which relates simply to the, the potential of land that is not used, also arable land in general, to encourage uh, the production of uh, more renewable energy, including for PV. How do you think the revision of the Lulu CF, remaining technology neutral, could encourage more use and more synergies uh, with the production of renewable energy today? Well, thank you. Thank you very much for, for this question. I, uh, well, the LULUCF will be, of course, review, and uh, I know that my colleagues from DG Clima have already started an impact assessment on, the, on this review. I think that at this precise moment, I'm not allowed to, because this is still under discussion, so I, sorry, but I cannot give you my personal views on, on it. But I think I want to, to reiterate what I have seen, uh, what I have said uh, before in the, I think that um, not only the, the Lulu CF regulation, but also the common agriculture policy, the ongoing reform, there needs to be a very strong link between this review on the, on the Lulu CF and also the common agriculture policy. So I, I also encourage you to, to follow it very closely with the co-legislators and, um, and in, with the commission in the, in particular in the preparation of the impact assessment, because of course I, I fully agree with you. Um, of course, the agriculture sector has the, the obligation to produce food, but uh, all this, the land that is not used could be, uh, could be uh, devoted to, um, why not? I mean, to this kind of technology and many other geothermal and many other technologies, innovative solutions that are not at this stage very, um, very much developed. So, I mean, I have a positive approach, but I cannot reveal more because it's under, you know, consideration by my colleagues from other, from other DGs. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Um, so I think we will have to wrap up this webinar. Uh, of course, we would have liked to discuss much more uh, the specificities of AgriPV and how to bring it forward in Europe. Luckily, we are launching this afternoon our work stream on AgriPV as Solar Power Europe. So, so some of the lucky ones will have the opportunity to, to pursue this conversation. 
and uh, we will be happy to propose uh, new new content in this regard as well. Uh, Eva, you're the, the chairwoman of um, the AgriPV Workstream at Solar Power Europe. Maybe I will let you the opportunity to close this discussion and, and let us know a bit how you envisage uh, we can as Solar Power Europe contribute to this debate and what we could tackle within this Workstream. Mm. Yes, uh, just to make it sure, I think the main idea is to um, to propose a common uh, vision and strategy uh, from the industrial um, uh, part uh, on AgriPV and uh, following that uh, that with uh, best practice uh, guidelines for all the stakeholders and how we can make this market a win-win market for everyone, farmers and uh, IPP and also public policies, um, yes, and make it develop uh, well with the fair play, and uh, yeah, this is, will uh, be our main goal. <laughs> Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Eva. Many thanks to all the attendees, uh, which have remained uh, very numerous uh, with us uh, all across this uh, morning session, and again a huge thank you to our panelists, to Eva, to Stefan, to Christina for the very interesting uh, discussions today. Uh, I will simply invite the audience to, to keep engaging with us and uh, follow up our next upcoming webinars. Uh, tomorrow, webinar with the European Parliament on solar cities and regions to see how we can unlock the European rooftop potential. And of course, I think some barns and greenhouses uh, will also count into this, uh, this countdown. On the 28th next week, Shining Beyond Subsidies. So we will launch our new extreme on finance. Uh, to see how solar can also um, uh, well transition to new business models in an era uh, where subsidies are moving away. And the day after, a webinar in collaboration with Get Invest, a European program for um, uh, the deployment of renewable energies in, in other countries, notably in Africa, with a, the, a discussion on the impact of COVID-19 on the African solar sector. So a big thanks to all of you. I wish you a lovely day. It is very shiny here in Brussels. And I look forward to discussing with other participants uh, during our kickoff later this afternoon. If you would like to engage in our activities for AgriPV, do get in touch with us. And in any case, as said earlier, you will shortly receive an email with the recording, the presentations, and we will make sure that uh, you can have all your, all your specific questions answered. Thank you very much and have a good day.